I'm going to introduce Amanda Glassman, who's going to introduce the panel. Amanda is the Vice President for Programs here at the Center for Global Development and Director of Global Health Policy and a senior fellow. Um, Amanda spent time, it looks a little bit like a Latin conspiracy here at the Inter-American Development Bank where Myra spent time and I spent time, <laughs> but um, that's all to the good. Uh, at the Inter-American Development Bank, Amanda was the principal technical lead for health. Uh, it really means she was the chief economist for health <laughs> at the Inter-American Development Bank. And here at the center, she has done fantastic work on a whole set of issues, including value for money, priority setting in health, how the British do it, and how developing countries should do it, and more and more and more. Uh, if you go to our website, you'll just it blows me away every year to see what Amanda has accomplished in the prior year when we're talking. So Amanda, over to you to move on to this panel. Thank you very much, Nancy. I think I got a, rate, a promotion in her last comment. Okay, so uh, this panel will be about the, the getting into a little bit of the weeds on defining and measuring what we mean about women's economic empowerment. So I'd like to welcome our panelists to the stage. First, Jim Knowles, who is an economist. He's an independent consultant, and you've seen how important his role was in terms of the roadmap and doing some follow-up work on how to measure women's economic empowerment. We'll have Marcus Goldstein, who's a lead economist at the World Bank in the Africa region, where he is head of the Africa Gender Innovation Lab. And he'll talk about some of the experiments and studies that they've been doing on this issue. And finally, we have Dr. Linda Scott, who's the DP World Chair for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the Said Business School at Oxford University. Um, she has also worked extensively in this area and, and will tell us more about these issues. So I will join the panelists, and I will ask you provocative questions. The first ones are a setup, but then we're going spontaneous, okay? <laughs> so let's start uh, with you, Jim. What are the best indicators to measure women's economic empowerment? What are the biggest challenges with measuring some of these indicators? Uh, what do we mean? And is empowerment a final outcome, or is it a means to an end, or both? Do you want me to go up there, or you? Want, you're, 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 you're okay. Generally, stay here, and we can. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's all I have to That's answer. That's it. Huh? Five minutes or less. Well, I think uh, <clears throat> the the best way for me to answer the the first question is to refer you to the website that Myra discussed, because there's much too much. I would put you all to sleep if I tried to. Um, answer that uh, question, because there are a lot of indicators involved. This, the second question is, what are the challenges? <laughs> are you skipping ahead? At least uh, give us a couple of examples from that roadmap work. What well, do it's we not, mean by power and yeah. agency and things like that? Well, it's, it's, it's not so much the roadmap work that uh, mm -hmm. focused on uh, indicators. It's, it's more this, this uh, uh, metrics uh, activity that uh, Myra focused on uh, quite a bit. And, um, and, and, and the, there, there are, you know, three types of, three levels of indicators, final, intermediate, and direct uh, outcomes that were identified during the meeting and subsequently in our uh, discussions and work. And for two different groups of women, um, urban entrepreneurs and business leaders and rural uh, uh, women, farmers, and, and, and rural women entrepreneurs. So there are two groups of, of women. So the indicators, uh, some of them were, were in common. Um, I, I think you could almost uh, introduce another classification, which is economic and, uh, and other. <clears throat> because a, a very important conclusion of the convening, which, which Myra summarized in the six principles, was the uh, recognition that we had to go well beyond economic uh, indicators like income, savings, asset accumulation, uh, to, to look at a wide range of social outcomes, um, uh, such as uh, you know, overall happiness, stress, self-confidence, self-esteem, 
uh, uh, gender uh, roles within the household and within the community and, and, and several others. Uh, so, uh, you know, these, there, there was a wide range of, of outcomes and uh, we really went uh, mainly to the level of outcomes in the convening. But in the subsequent work, which is all uh, in, at this uh, website, we have uh, gone to the level of indicators and even tried to identify which of the indicators is uh, suitable for uh, you know, traditional monitoring and evaluation and which are more suitable to impact evaluations, uh, which uh, usually involve a, a, a more detailed uh, household uh, survey. So um, I, is that enough? Or yes, that's you? good, that's yeah. good. I mean, did you want to say a little bit about the special challenges of measuring the effects of well, there, kinds of programs? Yeah, sure, there are lots of, of special uh, challenges, particularly in the case of uh, rural uh, women, mm -hmm. because a lot of the activities of, uh, that rural women do are are sort of embedded in the household. Other household members participate in those. And uh, in some cases, the woman is the, is the primary participant, but in others is, is, uh, is, is a secondary participant. It's very difficult to link in a rural context um, changes in income or, or other economic uh, outcomes to individual uh, women. And so uh, therefore, it's very important to look at the uh, household level, what's happening at the household level. For example, an intervention could focus on, um, you know, a, 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 an enterprise led by a woman. And if, if uh, one looks only at the effects at that enterprise level, one may not see that the woman is spending more time in that particular activity and is spending less time in, say, the family farm. Uh, or is spending more time in that activity and uh, it may affect other family members, including children who may have to help out either in the enterprise or in uh, uh, filling other responsibilities in the, in the household. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that's one of the um, main challenges yeah, in the case yeah. of women. So looking at household issues as well yeah, as the Yeah, yeah, looking the, at the, the household level, particularly in, mm -hmm. in, in rural areas. Yeah. yeah. Let me ask Marcus now. Uh, you've mentioned the use of household surveys and impact evaluations. Myra talked about rigorous evaluation. What do we mean when we say rigorous evaluation? What, what kinds of study designs would represent rigor? So I, I think uh, it, it's in the eye of the beholder a lot of times, right? There's no, there's no textbook definition. And so I think the important thing is being educated consumers. And so what I look for when, when I think about rigor is a carefully constructed counterfactual mm -hmm. in the impact evaluation space. This is, this is what I'm looking for, which is, so is, a, is a representation of what would have happened to your beneficiaries if they hadn't been in the program. And so you need a group that looks on average about the same as, your, as the people participating. And so you can use those with your household surveys to trace the impact of the program over time. And that really helps establish this causal link between the program activities and those outcomes that you care about that are, that are very important, as we heard earlier. Can you give us an example of a recent impact evaluation that you've done in the innovation lab? Uh, how, you know, what kind of study design it had, uh, what sort of outcomes, and then maybe let's throw in, did it have some impact on the policy associated with that program? Or yeah, exactly. Um, have some water. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, or maybe some gin. <laughs> yeah, gin. Yeah. Then, then we get a very rigorous answer. Um, so um, I'll give you a, a, a series of two, because I think when you're talking about policy impact, it's a long haul. It's the long haul. Mm -hmm. um, so the government of Rwanda asked us to evaluate a pilot they had done of land title registration. And so we went in, and there we constructed a comparison group. I'm not, the details are, mm -hmm. are long. And, um, you can ask them that in the Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll draw pictures. Um, 
and we, we teased out sort of the effects. And I think what was interesting to me is we got good effects and we got not so good effects. Uh, sort of where you can use this kind of tool for advocacy is we saw big investment effects. So men's investment uh, in the land went up by 9, 10%. Uh, women's investment in the land went up by 18%, right? So you can see women had worse property rights before. Getting these better property rights has a big impact for them and for their economy. What didn't work so well was some, the, the government was very careful to avoid when the land titles were issued to, um, to protect women's rights, in the spousal rights, and so they had a, a very firm rule that if a couple were not legally married, the, the, the land couldn't be shared. Um, so what was happening for women who weren't legally married was they were actually losing property rights in this process. And we found that out in the pilot. Mm -hmm. um, and this is why you pilot. Um, mm -hmm. So th the government, we were now actually finishing a randomized design of the national program. They took it to scale. And they fixed that, right? They changed their policy and how they were implemented. It was a policy for the right reasons, but the way it was being implemented wasn't, was, was disenfranchising a certain group of women. And, and they've changed that. And so I think this kind of thing, and, it's, and you see the effects now. Mm -hmm. So I think this kind of sort of evolutionary learning, piloting, taking something to scale, but still learning when you go to scale, um, really can, can add to our advocacy toolkit, it can add to our project toolkit, and sort of make better policy. Yeah, that's a really good story. Let me turn to Linda then and ask you, so we say we all buy into this idea of the rigorous evaluation and evidence-based approaches and things like that. What is the difference between what happens in reality in most <laughs> programs versus <laughs> this, let's call it be better practice? Yeah, okay. Um, um, I think that what we're dealing with here is, a, is on many levels a new phenomenon, a new undertaking. Um, there's uh, it's new work for economics, it's new work for gender studies. We're dealing in a lot of cases with new types of cross-sectoral partnerships. We're dealing with um, uh, new technologies often. Um, and uh, But it's also important to bear in mind that a lot of what we're doing is new to the communities where we're uh, uh, trying to uh, deliver. And that ends up being, I think, a very big issue. I think it is also the case that we, even though it seems like a lot's going on and a lot is going on and it's very cool, we have no idea how big this is going to get. Um, my group just finished doing a massive literature kind of literature review, I won't call it systematic, um, to back up the Walmart uh, stuff that Milan was talking about. We looked at over 700 pieces of um, publication and basically found very, very little that would uh, address this particular intervention, uh, which was in, in some sense, it wasn't because it wasn't an intervention, it was an exchange. It was trying to integrate women into the global marketplace. And once you get into an exchange situation, you're dealing with reciprocity, you're dealing with uh, that many more levels that you can't control. Uh, a counterfactual, I don't even know what it would be. Um, and we just really found that, wow, uh, you know, the world, including us, has been going around thinking, ooh, the best thing would be if we could get Walmart on this, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, because for these women to be able to sell is a really big thing, but it is actually really complex and there wasn't much uh, uh, there. Um, I wanted to um, address, yeah. if I can, because um, you asked for the three challenges, so I've been sitting here trying to have a good answer. <laughs> um, <coughs> that uh, Because it's relevant to the Walmart thing, and then I did want to talk about the on-the-ground stuff yeah. just very quickly. The um, the uh, The first thing is being able to measure women's empowerment agency, voice, whatever it is we're talking about, I want to echo what Milan said. This, is, this, this has to happen. For some of us, it is why we're here, as opposed to economics, purely speaking. Um, but we need to understand that it is a process. We all know from our own life stories, it is a process. Um, and we need to figure out a way of measuring that and dealing with it as a process, because it's not only what we're interested in achieving, but if, if we do not get through that process, we will not achieve what we want to achieve. So it's the most explanatory variable, mm -hmm. uh, all right, uh, eventually. I think it will be the thing that tells us why something worked or did not. But we're really not in a, a situation to do that right now. The second thing is, is that this happened with the Walmart thing. We need to find something that is internationally comparable, and I mean really internationally comparable, and not just developing nations. 
All right, not only because some programs will be international, such as the Walmart one, but also because really the core phenomenon here is the gender disparity. And all these questionnaires have looked actually at local manifestations of the gender disparity, and we need to, we need to get below that. Um, and then uh, finally, the ripple effect, or what you want to call it, the gender effect, whatever. Uh, this is way harder to measure than anybody thinks. Uh, as far as the question of rigor, I am getting back to your question here. Uh, we, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, this is what academics do, right? We sit here and huff and puff about rigor. Um, <laughs> uh, the truth of the matter is, is that if you're out there on the ground in some remote area, you're always very aware that you are not dealing with white mice. All right, and you are not dealing with a lab, and you're getting pushback and screw-ups and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> and it's really hard, and I, I kind of think that some, uh, particularly on randomized control trials, which is something I'm, I do, um, we're getting a little bit too much uh, in love with the idea that we are dealing, we're pretending like we're dealing with a lab. We are not dealing with a lab. And if we don't get honest about that, we're going to end up with a lot of screwy policy. Okay. That's a, as, as we say in We're Oxford. definitely not in the lab. I think, I think we can to that. But you've mentioned, you know, what we should get to some internationally comparable measures of this concept of empowerment. Can you say a bit more about that? Is it attitudes? Is it knowledge? I mean, you know, is it only questionnaire? Is it qualitative work? What, what does that look like in practice? Yeah. I mean, most examples. of the questionnaires now, it seems like they have a series of things that you asked it. Well, one thing we found was, first of all, this, that empowerment is something that is being done in a developing country context. All the studies, most of them were in Bangladesh, in fact. It's a very narrow <laughs> bunch of stuff. Okay. And, that, um, and the reason we had to look at this was because the Walmart program was in North America. And um, the kinds of questions that are being asked are things like whether or not you can leave the house without your husband's permission. This is a perfectly reasonable question to ask and a very good indicator in developing context. If you ask that to a graduate student in San Francisco, they're like, why are you asking me that? All right, because that's weird. Okay? <laughs> so, so, so we need to, and yet clearly, there is women's economic inequality in San Francisco too, right? And, and a gender divide everywhere. And so we need something. So that's what I mean. I do think some things like attitudes would work, but I'm gonna don't want to do all the time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so let me ask you a question. If if we can't evaluate every program rigorously, let's say, using some standard methodology or a counterfactual, how would you prioritize what you would use these more experimental methods for versus some other kind of tracking? Given, given, given that you have scarce resources. Maybe I'll ask Marcus and Jim also to chime in on this issue. You have a set budget. You're facing probably many demands. How do you decide what's important to evaluate in this rigorous way or not? So how to decide what to evaluate rigorously? Yes. And then what to do for the not yeah. rigorous? Well, let's, let's not use the wrong term to uh, use. Uh, or the, the not. RCTs. Yes. Not uh, let's well, beyond that, there's other things. There are rigorous non-RCTs. Yes, sure. there are. Yes. Um, so, how did I think this is where the idea of a roadmap is really useful, mm -hmm. right? So, I think that the report that Myra and her team did is super useful because it showed us, okay, here's where we know something, and here's where we don't know a lot. Um, and here's where we know nothing. And, and sort of going into those spaces and figuring out, uh, here are some things we could try that might address this. So, th so that's one piece of the puzzle. But the other piece of the puzzle is you kind of have to figure out what to try. And I don't, I don't think we totally know that. So one global problem is occupational segregation. And, and I think understanding sort of how people end up in the jobs they do and, what, and the role of norms and mentoring and all of the things that influence that, which I think there's a global, there's global lessons on that. Doing some, you're not going to do an RCT to answer that question. You have to do other kinds of research and, and answer that. Um, and taking that and then bringing that to the policy space um, and then trying to evaluate sort of thing, things that address that. And you have a hierarchy because you can sort of look at the indicators you care about and see which which seem to be the major causes for that, mm -hmm. and then tackle those in order. And you know, roadmaps, doing the kind of gap analysis of what we still don't know. Mm -hmm. so. 
And how have you done that within your own, your lab? The lab. <laughs> that yeah, sounds, we, we, sounds experimental, and, doesn't it? And, and I'm going <laughs> to agree with yeah. with you. It, yes. You know, it's not science. It's art. So um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you think we wear the white coats, we're in trouble. Um, <laughs> But I, I think what we've done, we, we sort of work in four areas, agriculture, land, um, enterprise development, and school to work transitions. And in those areas, what we've been doing is sort of what we call white papers, looking at what we know about the constraints, which turns out in some cases to be less than we thought. Mm -hmm. I think that's been a voyage of discovery for us. And then sort of where the evidence is. Um, and I think one thing that's interesting is thinking about you know, if, if you're trying to get sort of equal profits for entrepreneurs or to that space, uh, the intervention might not be in sort of the business trainings kind of space. It may be outside. And so thinking about the fact that, you know, these things are, are tied together, different dimensions of empowerment, economic empowerment, or however other, many other dimensions you want to think. And so thinking about sort of the multiple impacts of different kinds of programs and how they can affect economic outcomes, but also social outcomes, agency outcomes, mobility outcomes. Okay. Jim, would you have something to say about that in terms of <coughs> what issues require more lavish techniques versus uh, following over time or other qualitative methods? I think that uh, that uh, if you're uh, a funder, for example, if you have a program and you see uh, an exciting new intervention that you think might have uh, considerable impact within that program, it, it, it should be a candidate for a serious uh, mm -hmm. impact evaluation. Or if, you, if, if you're um, expanding, mm -hmm. rolling out, something that you think is uh, highly successful based on traditional monitoring and evaluation, it might also be a good candidate for mm -hmm. uh, serious, uh, rigorous impact evaluation. But not as, as one of the six principles that we came to in this convening that Myra discussed. You, you will recall that one of them was not every project or not every intervention can be rigorously evaluated, but we can learn from every intervention. There are qualitative research tools. And I would, um, if there was one message I would <laughs> want to get out, is the importance of traditional monitoring and evaluation. Uh, trend monitoring, uh, process evaluation, performance monitoring, even if you're doing an, an impact evaluation. It's terribly important to have that kind of information uh, available to people doing an impact evaluation so that they can see things like Marcus was, was talking about in, in the pilot that he uh, described. <coughs> so that would be uh, one message that I would want to get out to. Okay, I think that's an important point. You, you raised the issue of the role of funders. Um, if you, as people who work on this kind of policy research of different kinds, what would you say to funders in terms of what their role might be in this space? So we have you know, different kinds of funders in this space. We have the usual bilateral aid agencies. I'm speaking at the global level. Obviously, they're governments themselves, but uh, there's um, the corporate the social responsibility groups that are doing a lot of work in this area. What, what would you recommend? And would it be different for different kinds of funders? Maybe I'll ask you that, Linda. Um, I, think, I think what I would go for would be this idea of, you know, you're going to learn something, right? Um, and to try to look at it as a, each project is a stepping stone. Now, obviously, each project you're going to have to assess, and you should, right? But if you, and we are, going to continue, right? And so that at the very least, if we can take away something that goes to the next project, right? That we can share with other people who are doing work like, you know, what we're doing. And that, to me, in practice, means that you, you collect as much data as you can. And you do it in a lot of different ways. You do focus groups, participant observations as well. It, you know, you do as much as you can do while you're there. Right, so that you can triangulate. I think multi-method and triangulation is where we need to go, right? Because I think it's much more explanatory because a lot of times you get some outcome of the test or whatever and it's like, what? 
It helps you. It helps you to explain, but it also helps you to start understanding your change process. You need to have a theory of change. We keep talking about that. We do not a very good job in this area of it, and um, and that is what you can take on to the next. So my my thing I think would be to emphasize rich data collection, triangulation, and long-term perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can, can, can yeah. I add something just quickly to that? And that is, I think, um, one message to funders, I think, is that in addition to the projects that they do to help people, you know, beneficiaries directly, they can contribute to a knowledge base in evaluation right. that may help to help beneficiaries worldwide. Mm -hmm. So it's this public good right. na uh, nature of a lot of the uh, serious and thorough impact evaluation that I think is needs to be stressed to 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 funders. You have to kind of look beyond the immediate beneficiaries and think about the global beneficiaries mm -hmm. that you're trying to to help out. Yeah. So your next move, but also everyone else's next yeah. investment. Yeah. Marcus, do you have some reflections on this? I mean, how much priority does this have inside the World Bank? How are you funded? How does that all work? Okay, all these questions. <laughs> yeah. uh, anybody have a dime? Um, yeah. So uh, just quickly, I, I think the prior. I just want to add some priorities yes. for for thinking about funding. I think I, I totally agree with what's been said. I think we're still, even in the quantitative space, we're still not there, mm -hmm. particularly in the gender dimension, right? So one of my colleagues at the at the Living Standards Measurement Survey Group has been leading this project to look at how best to measure assets. And you know, when, when you go into a household and you interview people separately, and you ask about assets, you get a heck of a lot more female-owned assets than if you just go ask the best informed, mm -hmm. right? And so I think understanding what we're getting and then what it means, hmm? mm -hmm. because like, what does it mean to own? Let's not go there. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> uh, I think getting getting into that space, we're starting. It's really exciting. You know, at one level, people are like, "Oh God, you just like you're so micro, micro. I don't want to know about the deep." But we're unpacking the processes and we're understanding the power relations as we do this, and it's shedding light into places that sort of we haven't seen much before. And I think that kind of work is super exciting, and that's that's an area to go. And the second thing is to organize, right? Because I. I think funders, and this is to, to bring it back to the World Bank, because you asked me to. Um, You're employed by them. Yeah, and I'm employed by them. Um, <laughs> don't make the jokes. Okay, <laughs> but, um, but it's, I, I think it's about organizing it and making an agenda. Um, I, I think one of the things that funders like to do is say, we're going to do an open call for papers on gender. Mm -hmm. um, and you... The interesting thing about gender, that's n not immediately obvious, I think, is there are a bunch of people out there looking for money for their research who say, okay, I'll just separate it by male and female, and look, presto, I can get some money. And they do, and it, that's interesting. We, you can get some interesting lessons that way, but it's not the main way to do it. And so I think taking a targeted approach, we want to know about this, and this is why, and this is how, I think is going to lead a much more concrete thing. We've been trying to do that in the bank, but I, others are trying to do, and the, the roadmap's a great example of that. Okay, great. Well, now let's turn to your questions or comments to okay. the panelists. I see someone there in the back, Charles Kenny. Hi, I'm uh, Charles Kenny from CGD. Um, I, I actually do work on gender here too, and as Nancy was saying, um, uh, we're hoping there's going to be a series of events, so please come back in November for a, uh, a, a session on, on nudges and gender. Um, the point of that session is going to be kind of, here's what the research says, and then asking a bunch of policymakers, so why aren't you doing what the research says you should be doing? <laughs> and that leads to a question for the panel, which is, is there a payoff to more rigorous research? Do you see policymakers pay more attention when you know, the research is better? Or do you see the policymakers pay more attention when it's better advertised? <coughs> Linda. Well, of course, I believe that you know, quality research is really important because it tells you how to behave. Okay, that's, that's the main reason. It's you know, how, how to plan your next project and ultimately the, the policy implications. 
But I would have to say it's pretty important how it's advertised. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would just have to admit that. Um, there's a lot of good research that nobody ever reads. Mm -hmm. That's what we do in academia, right? Um, and, and one of the things actually that I think is kind of cool about this whole area is it does get a lot of attention and people are willing to go ahead and publish things like the roadmap that just, and just get it out there for people to use. Um, and I think that's helping to stimulate the quality of the research. So I hate to say it, but it's, I think it's both are important, but I, I think we should not under, uh, underestimate the importance of being able to communicate. Absolutely. Did, Jim, did you want to say something about this? Well, uh, I live in the field. I, I live in Thailand and work uh, intensely with uh, uh, governments in that uh, region. I didn't bring the weather here, by the way. It's not my <laughs> fault. But, uh, um, you know, it's, it, it's really shocking how little attention is given to, to evaluation uh, by any of the countries that I, I work with. It's all about politics and covering the whole population immediately and making sure that everybody knows about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think th the policy makers you're asking about are a different uh, group that I don't have much contact with these days. Mm. And I think they're, they're different countries are obviously different, but you know, if you think of Mexico or Chile yeah. that has different set up regions these councils are very different, on yeah. evaluation that have not necessarily entered this area of women's economic empowerment, but as yeah. a government sure. have that kind of yeah. Uh, culture, let's say, but you know, how do you, Marcus? What's your experience? Yeah, you no, work I a lot with I, governments as well. I, I think I, I'm going to agree with Linda. Sort of advertisement matters, but then some policymakers have that inbuilt appetite. So if you get them, you're lucky. Uh, but then I think the other thing is, as researchers, we often forget about is follow through. You know, so I'll talk to a minister and and should be like, that's a great, you know, that adolescent girls club. That sounds like a great idea. How do I do it? Right, and so I can put her in touch with the program people. That might help, but I think what we've been experiencing within the World Bank is more handholding is needed. Sort of help people make those connections, help them understand the program details. Right, so if if you want to act on a piece of evidence, help me interpret it in my space, how it applies to to what I'm doing, mm -hmm. and sort of carry it through. Um, and that's it takes a lot more time, mm -hmm. right, and and effort, and and it it's it's globally, not just for gender, I think it's, it's something that's missing. You're starting to see people fill it in sort of the evidence for policy space. But for gender, I think the, you know, the impacts could be huge because there are people who are sort of like, that sounds really interesting. How can I follow up and helping them? Yeah, if I could add on to that. I, this really is a problem, I think. Um, we, um, my group did a, a, way back when, before anybody realized that sanitary pads for, for school girls were important. Remember, that was like seven years ago. Mm -hmm. um, we, were like the, we were like the first people to go out and do a, an empirical study of this. And we released it as a working paper. Some of my colleagues are still mad at me about this, but I didn't want to wait for what mm. would, you know. And fortunately, it, was a hot, it became a hot topic. And we did get a lot of um, inquiries from policy people. I, would, I still am really glad we went ahead and, and released that paper. But one thing that did happen that we were not prepared for and continues to happen to this day um, is we get emails and calls and visits from people who have small NGOs in remote areas who are some, uh, a group that wants to put together a program or whatever. And it's really important because this is a problem that really needs a lot of reach to, to do. But we were not prepare for that. And, and I mean, we're academics. We were not set up to deal with that at all. And so I think it would be good to think about those issues. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good point. OK, in the back, please say who you are and where you're from. Um, I went to California Public Health. Mm -hmm. um, question about what you found in the research around social capital and changing in perceptions and measurement around those two huge issues. Social capital. And what was the second one? Perception. <laughs> so attitudes. Okay, okay. Jim? No, I That's passed. the hardest question yet. <laughs> sure. Go for it. Um, okay, so the network, uh, the social capital thing, uh, we have been looking at it mostly, it's called networks in the in, uh, right, entrepreneurship. And it is amazing. You know, the conventional wisdom is, oh, we got to get these women to networks, right? 
uh, when you go to see how it's measured, uh, it's just all over the map. It's stuff like how often you go to church. I mean, it's just bizarre some of the ways that people have done this. And so we act like we know. But actually, and this again to Marcus's point, the gender spin is really interesting. And people have said, well, it's because women have smaller networks. Oh, no, that's not it. Actually, women are pretty social some places. Oh, well, it's that they don't have the right kind of networks. Well, no, actually, they kind of have the same as men. And it's more, it's actually, I think it's more because women feel hesitant to exploit their personal networks for business, right? And, and so it's a gender thing, right? And, but I think we're not there on, we are just so not there. We're, there are hundreds of studies, we are not there. Um, the perceptions, I, I, I think, I think there are some attitudes that can be used as bellwether mechanisms that we should be look, paying more attention to. Attitudes toward violence and attitudes toward who gets a job in tar, hard times. Those are two really good ones. I think the other thing, though, is that we really need to be looking at psychometrics. And I'm not, frankly, the kind of person who's normally big on that stuff. Um, but I think there are, uh, instead of just asking people, well, are you confident, more confident than you were before you did my program, we need to have, we need to use tested banks. There are tested banks of, of questions for that stuff, and we need to learn how to use it. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really important point, uh, that there are some standard measures. Marcus, did you want to? Pitch yeah, in there on social capital. I, I think look, I, I'm I'm going to agree Marks. with Linda. Like it, we, we're we're starting to see really interesting things happen and bit, bits and pieces. So we just we're just working on a evaluation of basically an IT training for college grads in Nigeria, and we did this thing called an implicit association test, which is really measuring uh, it's, it's measuring sort of biases that that you wouldn't vocalize, right? And what we found is in this training that women in the training who were biased against women being professional, so they went in with this bias that women should are less likely to be professional, they did much better from the training, right? Because, you know, hypothesis, unpacking would be good, uh, hypothesis is for them this training opened it up and so, so they had sort of three, four times the average program impact on the likelihood of moving into IT. Right? But their stated biases had no impact. So stated biases didn't matter, but, but these implicit biases that were there. Again, one small sliver, right? And I think with tools like psychometrics and so on, we're really starting to understand how the programs impact these things, but also how the programs can, can sort of overcome some of these things. So it, it's a really interesting space and broad. Anne Hudock from Plan International USA, and I just want to thank all of you for these really great comments and good discussion of these issues. I wanted to ask if the research or other research you've done has looked at the post-conflict or transitional environments, because I think we've seen anecdotally that there's a lot of economic space that opens up for women in conflicts. And how the question I have is, how do we preserve that organic space, and how do we measure it? Conflicts and also recession. Ironically, that's when a lot of women go into the workforce. But do you have any views on that or that you, you saw during these past few years? Well, the only uh, conflict <coughs> country that I've worked in um, extensively is Cambodia. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, uh, and of course, it left many widows, head, heads of female heads of, of household, as it turned out. And, uh, and I think you know that has led to a lot of opportunities for women that might not exist in other settings. So that uh, suggests that it's a it's an opportunity to exploit when these kinds of situations occur. But uh, beyond that, I, I I can't say except to note the the interesting finding in in my region as as in contrast to, for example, South Asia, that female-headed households are almost always better off economically than male-headed households um, for, for reasons that we don't fully understand but can only suspect observing males, you know, in, in cafes and everything, uh, most of the time consuming large quantities of alcohol, but anyway. Yeah. Let's, Nancy, you had a question? Who's the boss? Uh, <laughs> okay, well, it's a little bit um, out of the blue, but in hearing about social capital, uh, we have this, I have this dilemma in my mind, which is the following. We're doing a lot of work on uh, the problem in schooling 
of children not learning very much, but sitting in classrooms. So that seems problematic. On the other hand, I rather like the idea that girls get to go to school, get out of the house, talk to each other. Uh, so the question is not about today's approach, which is quite micro on measuring how to measure empowerment, but how, how how, what's the next step on research at a more meta level that requires data over time, mm -hmm. thinking through this social capital issue, applying rigorous metrics to something where it's much harder. You can't do an RCT mm -hmm. or even a natural experiment in the same way. Mm -hmm. Just interested for our future agenda on women's empowerment. Okay. So sort of the long-term uh, interventions that might result in increased economic empowerment. Um, Marcus, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, oh, um, I, there's a lot we could do. I mean, I, I, and it's a very broad question. I, I, I think looking at sort of earnings at, at sort of the economy level um, and sort of the differences there and where they're coming from, that's, that's sort of a, a long-term thing, and it's something you know. It's it's, it's a global issue, and so for entrepreneurs in wages, and so tracking that over time, understanding sort of where those gaps in earnings are coming from, I think that's that's sort of a big meta. Th I mean, it's not new, um, but there's still work to do in that area. Mm -hmm. Others have sure that's thoughts on these issues. Go ahead. Yep. I mean, maybe what I would ask is also what the time frame is for some of these evaluations, because we tend to do measurement, let's right. say, within a year, within two years, maybe five years. But there are very few programs, actually, that are followed over time to see whether being a beneficiary mattered or not for some of these longer-term empowerment outcomes. So that's, you know, that's another possible yeah. agenda for the future. But Linda, did you? Um, yeah, if I can, um, I'll try okay. here. Um, I think, I think you asked about social capital, and there's, of course, there's social networks and social capital, and you use the social capital that you use for both, but I think that the, what you were describing, Nancy, is more what I think of as social capital in the, sen in the sense of um, having skills and being able to present yourself well, and, and, and this kind of thing is a little bit, I think, a little bit different. It is very important. Um, we've been studying the sanitary pad thing in rural Africa since 2007, and we have looked at every kind of looking at the class roster, the attendance records, the enrollment records, all that stuff that you do. And it, I just can't even begin to tell you what a nightmare it is. Um, can't begin, all right. But, um, and so that those kinds of measurements, but actually this kind of, uh, the, I, I do believe that if you could get to the point of measuring things in a psychometric or something like that, I think you would see, I think I saw an impact immediately just from the fact that somebody was paying attention, okay? And, and I, think it, I think that in our very first intervention, I think our being there changed those girls forever. You will never convince me otherwise. So that I think that you could do a long-term thing if you could agree on the set of measures. And I think one of the exciting things now is that you can eventually, not too distant future, do it by mobile phone, right? You can, you could be, you could be asking people in a very broad area a few simple questions. So I think it could be very cool, but I'm totally, you know, this is like Jetsons. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're now at uh, 10.05, and I think my time is up, our time is up. So just to thank the audience and to thank you, panelists, do you have any last yeah. things you'd like to say? Before we wind up, something like onward. Yeah. Go. Do more. Okay. Go. Do more. <laughs>